working from home can improve performance by as much as 13%, a Stanford University study found. And here's another one that's kind of interesting, is virtual employees are 29% happier than on-site employees. Now, let's take that with a grain of salt, right? Because we're looking at it from the point of view of, that was before everyone was forced to do it. <laughs> and we're getting a little bit, of, as Nancy was telling me before, Zoom overload, right? Where we're getting into that. Uh, but they also said that 34% of people said that they'd take a 5% pay cut to work remotely. Once again, grain of salt on that, right? But it's, it's starting to indicate that this is something that, that after we get done with the pandemic, after we get done with the crisis, I think more people are going to uh, embrace this type of virtual work style. Um, there's a lot of our clients that we've talked to over the past month and a half who at one point said, we don't, our policy is that we don't have virtual workers they've changed that and they're learning how to incorporate that. And I think going forward, that's gonna be a big difference in the way that we interact, the way that we uh, communicate, the way that we move forward. So we're gonna be talking about that as um, uh, for the next 20 minutes or so on our call here. And just so everyone knows, let will give you a little background on Dale Carnegie uh, as an organization, if you haven't heard of us before, but. Uh, we uh, work in, we have about 200 offices around the world. We're a global organization. And uh, we've worked with millions and millions of people that have graduated from our programs, whether it's in a public setting where we bring people together, or if it's in a corporate setting where companies bring us in to do training for them. We also have uh, a lot of experience in all 50 states and 85 countries. We're translated into 30 different languages. But what's interesting too is about 10 years ago, Dale Carnegie as an organization invested in online learning. And, but we wanted to make it different because the way that we interact in our classrooms was different. So we called it live online learning, which is an interactive way of doing training. So we do it like this. We've been doing this for 10 years where we interact and we engage in conversations and we, uh, we do polls and we do breakout rooms and uh, we've been doing that for 10 years. So it was really easy for us to, and this is, I was saying this yesterday on a call, is that we pivoted, right? That's a new buzzword. We pivoted the way that we're doing business. And I'm sure many of you are doing the same thing, right? And, and I, I, you're probably gonna get sick of that word too, pivot. Um, but we pivoted to move the room, move the room from a live classroom experience to an online classroom experience. And that's what a lot of people are facing today. Here's another stat that I found really interesting is that um, uh, a study was done, 1300 respondents, 80 different countries of organizations that are doing global business activity. And they said that only 22% of managers participated in virtual leadership training, right? So what does that mean? That means 78% of people have not been trained in something like this and how to run a, run a team or run an organization if it's forced to go virtually. So I'm sure there's some benefits that are out there on the, uh, the aspects of being able to work in virtual teams. So let's do this. Let's just think as a group, we'll do some group thing here. And if you could open up your chat and I believe your chat would be, I think it's at the top of your screen. If you go to the top of your screen with your uh, uh, mouse and it should pull something down and there should be a chat in there, go ahead and have just everyone type in the chat, just say hello. So we know that you have it. Oh, and I can't spell apparently. Do you know how to do it from a phone? Uh, you should be on Zoom. You should be able to do it. It should be in the upper left-hand part of your screen, I believe, in Zoom. All right. D. Zappala says hello. Dan says hello. Melanie says hello. Karen says hello. All right. We're getting there. Ken, let me know if you found that. I think, I believe Zoom has it in the upper left-hand part of the screen. Uh, but if not, don't worry. We could just say hello. Yeah, no, I, I, I can't find it. Okay. That's how no technological worries. I am. That's okay. All right, so what we're gonna do is in the chat, let's go ahead and just type in, what are some benefits to working in a virtual environment or managing in a, work, a virtual environment? 
So go ahead and just type in your answers there. We'll give you a moment to think about it and then type in the chat. Benefits of working. Ah, there we go. No commute. Thanks, Joyce. Yeah, Karen, no traffic. Anybody's been driving around? It's so easy right now to get through Fairfield County. It's beautiful. <laughs> Even at the tough times, like seven or eight o'clock. It's always casual Friday. I was looking it up. Uh, if you look up virtual meetings on YouTube, and there are some hysterical virtual meetings that have been recorded. And then people forget, they go to the bathroom, they get up and walk around in their underwear. So we do have to remember that it might be casual, but it's not that casual. <laughs> um, I can work in my jammies, absolutely. Less distractions, uh, that all depends on if you have kids at home. Uh, I know my team, we have some uh, people with some younger kids and that can be a distraction, uh, them running around. So let's find out what some of the experts said. I think we have uh, dogs in the office. There you go, as long as your dog doesn't bark. I like that, thanks, Margaret. So let's find out what some of the things that they said here. Um, well, we did, flexibility of time and schedule, right? Yeah, we can, we can start when we want, we can end when we want, um, we can get up and go for lunch, we can take that two hour lunch if we want. Nobody's really gonna be able to check and see, right? Unless we have to log in and we're being counted that way. Uh, let's see, uh, we had Freedom Workspace. You can work anywhere. I know I have one of my employees, she changes every 90 minutes, she changes rooms in her house for her apartment. So she starts in her bedroom, then she goes to her living room, then she'll sit in her kitchen, and then I don't know where she goes. But every time we do uh, virtual chats with her, she's in a different place. Uh, definitely lower employee costs. Um, there was some stats on employee costs, and it says businesses save almost 11000 uh, per year, per person, letting at least 50% of the 50% uh, of the people work virtually. So yeah, we can we can uh, save money on that travel time. We talked about increased productivity. That's an interesting one, and they have found that that it increases productivity because there's less distractions. I was just talking about this with my wife, who works at a uh, software company up in Rocky Hill, and uh, we were talking about the open concept theory, right? So where we have no cubicles, we firmly believe that that will be going away soon, right? Because there's nothing to stop the, uh, you know, somebody sneezes in an open concept, it gets everywhere, at least. And with cubicles, we can have walls there. But with the open concept, it increases distractions as well. And then greater workforce flexibility. So I think everyone has a lot of that. Oh, Nancy, healthier eating. Oh, I like that. You are better than us. Speak for yourself, Nancy. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going through even more bags of uh, peanut M&Ms, which is my favorite snack than I have been in the past. All right, so let's look at some virtual challenges. Um, take a look at this list that I just put up on the screen here. Uh, virtual team challenges, clarity of roles and processes. Um, that can be a challenge. Uh, establishing trust, building team engagement, and effective communication, all things that can be difficult. What would be some things that you would add to this? Virtual team challenges that you've faced or you've seen. Go ahead and just in the chat, go ahead and type those in. Challenges that you've seen. Give everyone a moment to do that. And once again, if you can't do the chat, then go ahead and take yourself off mute and just let her rip. Challenge of working in virtual teams. You know, it's just too long to type, but uh, we, I typically, I'm a business development manager, I typically meet once a week with our marketing manager and our president. And so what we decided is we would do a Zoom meeting every day at noon. So we're in touch yeah. every day. Yeah. Um, I went to the office last Friday and we met, you know, six feet apart with our masks on. My, yeah. We said we, we look like we're all in timeout. But that in-person conversation, even though we're in person this way, it was so different and so much more yeah. in-depth and effective that mm -hmm. we are going to continue to meet in person at least once a week. Yeah, so. I know. I, I get you, Karen. I, I, my, about a week ago, my, one of my employees, um, Carrie Turner, some of you might know her, she came into the office to pick some stuff up. I think I followed her around like a, like a lost puppy. She was going, I'm like, I'm just talking to her. I'm following her around and everything else. I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but I was so, I was so, yeah. So we lose that personal interaction with people that you know we we come to uh, to depend on uh, unreliable uh, technology, or uh, we lose our our internet connectivity. That's another one that can be a real challenge. Is that can go up and down. Um, definitely unscheduled communication. Yeah, definitely. If you we lose the ability to just have those uh, impromptu conversations with people when we're here. So, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about is how do we add that back into our virtual environment? And now we have to start thinking about planning for it as well. Uh, the nonverbal aspects of communication. LA is anybody, any, anybody and everybody can go get a free test now. And yeah. That means test those people in LA County. You can go get a test, even if you have no symptoms. Right. Or if you have no exposure, you can go get a test. Just, uh, Good. How do you know it's not your symptoms? Usually symptoms take quite a bit. All right. Sounds like somebody's having another conversation. Nance, if we can put that. Put them on. Put them on. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, we just experienced one of those challenges, didn't we? Side conversations when we didn't realize that we were, <laughs> well, so relevant and in the moment. Um, all right, so there are some others that are myths, myths of working virtually. And let's take a look at what those are. Prevailing myths. Virtual teams are less productive. You know, some of our stats say that that's not true, right? We know that we can be more productive. It's just got to be planned. Right, that's one of the things, the keys that we have to get through. Uh, technology will get in the way. We're showing right now, it's not. It's because we have to, it's required that we do that. We just have to figure out how to use it. And you know, the technology today, a lot of it's easy, you know, and, and it's just getting used to it. Um, it's hard to manage virtual workers, it is, right? Without a plan. And that's the thing is we have to create a strategy on how to do it. Uh, this is an interesting one. It will impair career adver advancement. Now, let's think about this. This, uh, this program was written and designed last year. And so that was a big thing is that you're not in the office, you're not being seen. If you're not being seen, then you might not be uh, uh, promoted the way other people are. And what we're finding right now is that's just exactly what needs to be done. And then we can't communicate effectively. We're gonna talk more about that with some tips that we have that for successful virtual teams. Let's go ahead and take a look through this list here. I'll give you a moment to read through it. These are some tips that we found, the best practices, and we're gonna explore uh, these, a few of these as we go along. So I'll give you a moment to read through this. Oh, Karen took a picture of it, excellent. That's, I always do that with my training sessions now as I ask people to take a picture of something. So if you want to take a picture of it or do a screenshot, um, this will be uh, sent as well. Laura and Nancy have confirmed me that the, this will be recorded and they'll be sharing it uh, in emails going forward so you can have that. Or if anybody wants the PowerPoint slide deck, I'll be happy to send that to Nancy and Laura too so that they can distribute it. All right. So taking a look at this list in the chat, please go ahead and put down the number of the best practice that you look at and go, that one is really interesting. Go ahead and in the chat, put down the number of the one that you found really interesting. All right, Margaret, number two, stop lecturing. Ask more questions. Yeah, we found that in a lot of cases because we're not face-to-face -face and uh, we have a tendency to, I, I always go back to the movie, The Incredibles, where Syndrome, the bad guy is sitting there and he starts talking and he goes, oh my God, you caught me monologuing, right? I don't know if you remember that part of the movie, uh, but yeah, it's, it's really is we have to plan the questions that we wanna ask so that we get people engaged and talking so that they don't just sit there and do other things or, you know, cause it's really hard to catch somebody using their phone, if they can put it right under the camera, it makes it look like they're still working, right? So we want to en engage them. Don't just lecture, ask more questions. Uh, uh, Donna, uh, Donna, okay, I'm guilty at number five. Uh, require video for added depth. How many people have said in the beginning of this when they were getting on Zoom calls, oh no, I'm not looking too good right now, so I'm not gonna turn my camera on, right? 
I, I, I've heard that so many different times, but there is a dimension to being able to see something. Uh, I know when uh, there's a lot of times uh, when people are more engaged, and I'm a true believer in this, if you can actually see somebody talking and I can use a little bit of hand gestures, people are gonna stay more engaged by having that conversation and looking at somebody than if they're just on a conference call. Um, so highly encourage that. Uh, number three, communicate consistently and concisely, right? So not only consistently, the speed, the way that you're communicating, but really put an emphasis on being concise. How can you say something in less words? And then we talk about this all the time in our presentations programs is really work hard to enunciate. And a lot of times enunciation just takes slowing down, right? It's just slow down how you're doing it. You don't have to go fast. Really take a, uh, an understanding of your pace. Good, so let's see, somebody, oh, Laura picked number seven. Increase energy by 50%. Why do you think we wanna do that? Laura, that's a great one too, I love that. Why, why do we wanna increase our energy? Um, just to keep everyone interested and yeah. positive and upbeat and we all need that. And yeah. I think, you know, you, we can't see, oh, we can't see the rest of our, you know, gestures, our bodily, right, our body. Yeah. So um, that's all we have is our, from like our neck up. And so we have to yeah. do what, what we can. Yep, and that, that's, that's one of, Dale Carnegie said that. He actually wrote um, a, a lot of articles and a lot of, uh, uh, he talked a lot about enthusiasm being the secret to success. He goes, if, if there's two people in the world, same intelligence, same experience, and you know, just the, the same abilities, he said, you'll find that the one with more enthusiasm is going to be more successful. And so we have to carry that enthusiasm over into what we do too. And, and that's what makes things more engaging, right? I mean, I'm, we've all been to that rotary meeting. We've been to, you know, a, uh, a talk at the chamber where somebody gets up and they're an expert in something and they come out and they're flat and monotone and you walk away. They, it could have the greatest information in the world for you. The unbelievable information that's going to make you millions of dollars. And if they come out flat and monotone, you're going to walk out of there and go, eh, it was okay, eh, right? But if they had enthusiasm, man, you're, you're going to get excited about doing something. So as a leader, or if you're on a virtual team, you've got to increase your energy tenfold, 50-fold, just get it going so that people will engage with you. Good. What else do we have? Uh, thanks, Laura. As I'm going back up here, number eight, AJ had number eight, focus on results. Yes, we have to determine what those results are. A lot of the processes that Dale Carnegie has in their programs are revolve around understanding what the desired outcome is. And so what does that mean? Is that we go in knowing what our desired outcome, what is the result that we're expecting? Right, and a lot of people skip this step because we're a lot of times we're doers, right? We, okay, we have a task, we're gonna jump in, we're gonna do it, we're gonna make it happen. Um, and they might go down the wrong path and which means we're gonna get the wrong result. So what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we understand, we're focusing on the result, we understand and we can define that result and then we can explain it to the group as we get into it. And if we're leading it or if we're doing something, really define what the outcome is. Excellent. So I appreciate everyone jumping in on the, uh, the chat. Uh, let's take one last moment. If there's something on here that you like, uh, let's make a commitment to utilizing this more, right? So if you take a picture or a screenshot and then somewhere uh, down there, just kind of write down, which one am I gonna use going forward in a virtual world? A moment to make that happen. And then let's think about what are the attributes of a virtual team leader? What makes them tick? So before we leave the screen, just think about what is it that when you're in a virtual environment, whether you've been uh, going to webinars or you have a remote team that you work with or you have a dispersed team, you know, what, what are the, the attributes that make somebody really successful when they're leading a virtual team? And let's go ahead in the chat and just jot down some of those. What are some attributes that you feel are 
good for team leading a virtual team. Engaging, yeah, yep, thanks Nancy. Getting people engaged in the conversation. Once again, going back to number two there, right? Asking more questions. Uh, respectful and encouraging, thanks AJ. Yeah, they, they help people, they, they build people up rather than breaking them down because then they're more willing to share, good. Uh, caring, interactive, yes, yes. You know, it's once, once again, we're trying to eliminate the lecture and, and get into the mode of, of an engaging conversation. So let's take a look at some of the things that our research has found is attributes of an engaging leader. So, you know, some of the things required, positive attitude, right? If you go in there cynical about having to work in a virtual environment, how does that come across to people? You're like, oh, this is gonna be horrible, it's terrible. I don't wanna do it, right? We gotta create a positive environment that people wanna do this. Hey, we're in this boat, let's make it happen. Let's do the best that we can. You know, I, the chamber here is doing a fantastic job of that, right? Can't get together in person. They jumped on it and they made a great environment for people to get together and network and, and socialize. Uh, we talked about excellent communication skills. You've got to concentrate to communicate, right? That's one of the keys here, concentrate to communicate. That's, that's if you're not thinking about what you're saying or how you're going to say it and planning that out, it's going to make it more challenging for you. Uh, once again, the drive for results, superior delegation skills. If you're a leader, you have to, in this environment, be able to delegate, right? Because you're just not, you can't do everything on yourself and, and you can't micromanage, right? It's going to be really challenging to micromanage. You're going to be on a lot of calls if you're micromanaging, right? And you're not going to be able to get your work done. So delegation skills, um, a cross-cultural competency. Um, what we like to think of that is that you have the ability and you're encouraging that culture um, and people to develop into that culture and then show a willingness to open to new ideas. I think that was pushed on us pretty quickly over the last few weeks is that we have to be open to these new ideas because it's our new reality, right? At least for another month, it's gonna be our new reality, right? And I think going forward after that, when we get into, you know, my team and I, we were talking about reopening strategies you know, we have no idea what the world's gonna look like in June, July, August, or in the fall. We're anticipating that it's gonna open back up, but what if it's a staged opening, right? Where it's just, it's, it's a, a limited opening. Um, that's gonna be a challenge for us. So we have to plan for that. Um, and we have to be willing to figure out new ways of doing things. So we found that there's five success factors for working in a virtual team. And it just so happens that they all begin with a C. So we'll call these the five C's of virtual success. All right, so let's take a look at these. We're just, we'll knock them off one by one. Um, connection. So I, I like to think here is that you have to be able to connect with the team, right? So the connection is gotta be good. So we've gotta be able to be sensitive to the people's differences. So with that, we have to trust and we have to learn what their differences is between the different people um promote the participation and collaboration right so not only do we have to you know learn about the people uh, but we have to promote that this is the way that we're going to operate we have to make sure that people will collaborate in that um somebody had said before um the social i think it was karen uh encourage the social interaction and humor that's really critical you know i mean we we don't have a water cooler so is there a way to create a water cool cooler environment. Maybe there's an open uh, uh, instant message room where people can just jump in or, you know, we create social time for people. I know uh, with me and my group, I, I told my team, I'm like, this Zoom, you know, it's it's the company's Zoom line, but you can use it anytime you want. If you want to have a virtual happy hour with your family or your friends or anything else like this, put it on the schedule and go do it. You know, it's, and then you can stay on as long as you want. We just have to plan around it, but we have to encourage that socialization. Um, acknowledge birthdays and special occasions, right? Before we could just walk by and we could say to them, oh my gosh, it's your birthday today, happy birthday. Now we have to plan to say that, right? So, but that improves the connection between, between people. And then also just one of the things, Dale Kearney, you were really well known for, is uh, creating a uh, recognition and appreciation. How are we spending our time doing that? Making sure that people feel important, 
that's, that's one of the critical areas there. The second one is confidence, right? So we have to develop confidence. So I like to think of it, if people believe in themselves, they'll be willing to take a risk. That's key. If you're willing to, if you're believing yourself, so how do we encourage that environment to get people to be more confident? So we have a new platform, we have a new stage, um, we have to build up their confidence. So, um, you know, I like to think of it that confidence comes from understanding the outcomes that we're trying to expect. So, you know, make sure that people know the vision and the purpose of why we're doing things. Share successes. Um, if people feel that they're doing well at something, their confidence goes up. It's awesome, you know? So we just have to put it out there. You know, we can't go back to the habit of just saying, well, they know they're doing good, right? Well, that's what they're expected to do. Well, we got to tell them, right? And tell them, you know, I like to say, catch them doing something good and then tell them, right? So, you know, go out of your way to find things. Um, and then, but we have to do it in a genuine, authentic way, right? We have to be sincere about it. So Dale Carnegie, we always have this formula for giving recognition. It's you find them doing something good. And so you, you create that, that, that detailed evidence. And then you come back and you tell them why you say that. So it might be a personality trait. You know, I really love that you're so punctual. You're always the first one on to our virtual calls. And I see that because, you know, that helps out and put it into relevant areas. Like I, I see that and that, that makes it comfortable for your clients to know that you've got their back and you're going to be there. You're not rushing, right? So give them something to uh, live up to. The next one is, we talked about this communication. Um, I think one of the keys to communication is listen, right? And do we listen enough? Uh, I know when we talk and we teach leaders and we teach leadership, we spend a lot of time on this concept, which is, you know, kind of an, uh, a, 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 an interesting phenomenon for a lot of leaders. Well, I listen. Okay. So let me ask you this. If you're listening, do you take your can, hands off the keyboard when you're talking to somebody that just popped into your office? And that usually gets them. You know, just like, uh, well, I know what they're saying. I'm like, I'm sure you do. <laughs> Try it. Take your hands off your keyboard and turn and face them. Oh, wow. What a revelation, right? Uh, but communicate. Um, we talked about there was a uh, there's an author and he's an executive coach. His name is Dr. Marshall Goldsmith. And he wrote a book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. All right. So Dr. Marshall Goldsmith, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Love the book. And he has a concept in it called Feed Forward. Uh, he took the theory of the Jahari window, which was really understanding what you know about yourself versus what others know about you. And he said the pot of gold is to, if you're willing to accept feedback from other people, then you're willing to, you could be a very good communicator. And so he created this whole thing about feed forward, right? Which is giving feedback to somebody and, and if they're willing to accept that, um, they're gonna become stronger, right? Um, and that's really the concept that we're looking for here. Uh, being able to provide constructive feedback to somebody without breaking them down positive messages. That's what we're looking for in communication. Then we talked about collaboration, right? And we have to create an environment of collaboration. And so what does that mean? Well, collaboration only happens when we trust each other, right? We're going to collaborate more effectively when we trust each other. So we have to have, be generally interested in other people. Uh, we have to make sure that information is shared. We're not holding on too tight to information. Um, Alan Mulally, there was a, a, he was the CEO of Boeing during the 9-11 crisis. And then he was, he, he left Boeing and he went to Ford Motor Company and he was the CEO of Ford Motor Company during the 2009 financial crisis. So can you imagine being the CEO of two major iconic brands during those times? And he found that he improved the collaboration of not only his executive team, but everyone else by really focusing on a couple of things. The first thing was he had a business model and he said, be tough on the numbers. Don't be tough on the people, be tough on the numbers. And he said, people first, love them up. He goes, and that's that he goes, was what the critical aspect of his success in getting both of those brands back on track again. Because remember 9-11, 
the airline industry took a huge hit, right? And, you know, people weren't buying planes, they weren't buying tickets, they weren't flying, they were scared to death to fly at that point. And he took them and he got them back on track. And same thing with Ford Motor Company, you know, there was, Ford was the only company that did not take a bailout by the government. They were able to save themselves and bring it around again. And it's because their teams were able to collaborate. And then the last one of our virtual uh, rules for success is commitment, right? So, you know, one of the big things was um, Alan Mulally had this, uh, this philosophy is that everyone on his team, and that means everyone in the organization, the hundreds of thousands of employees in both of those companies had to understand the vision, the purpose, and the strategy. And then they had to understand their role in it. Right, because you're not going to be committed to something if you don't understand how you play a part in the business. Right, so I, I like to think of it as an analogy: is that um, you know how many cogs, how many different moving pieces are in a a clock, and all of them have a role to make the clock tell time. And, and in business, has the same thing. There are no unnecessary roles in the business, but people might sometimes feel that they're unnecessary because they're brushed off, right? Or they're not given the understanding of how they, what their place is and how they help to make an organization run. So it's on us as leaders and managers to make sure that they're connected and they're aligned to the organizational practices, the vision, the purpose, and the strategy. That's our job as leaders. And in a virtual world, it takes even a, a, a more impressive ro role because we're not together all the time. So we have to make sure that we do that. So taking a look at these, connection, confidence, communication, collaboration, and commitment. Go ahead and uh, take a picture of this and then just take a real quick, you know, what's your commitment? Which one do you need to work on the most? All right. Give you a moment to think about that. And we're coming to the end of our time. I just want to thank everyone for allowing me to come out and talk to you today. And once again, uh, so thank you for allowing me to come out. And hopefully this gives you some understanding of how we can encourage and work in a virtual environment, how we can lead virtual teams, gives us some tools, some best practices, research, some ideas of, of areas to focus on. Um, you know, the, the key that I find in working in virtual is that the more you prep in advance, the easier it gets to work in a virtual environment, right? So the more planning you do, the easier it gets. But not just the planning of say the agenda, right? We don't wanna just say, well, I'm gonna plan an agenda. And I'm, but you know, what words are you gonna say? What questions do you wanna ask? What information do you want people to bring with them so that you can talk about? I gave the example that our team was talking about the uh, running a, you know, what a meeting, a, a information gathering, brainstorming, whatever you want to call it, of, you know, how are we going to have, what are we going to do in the reopening? Well, I sent that question out in advance and I'm like, think about this and bring ideas with you, right? So that we don't come in cold on that. And the, and the, the conversation was robust. People had information, they brought it together. Now we don't have all the answers yet, but I tell you what, we have a lot of information that we can, you know, move in any direction that we need to move because we have that. And it started from a plan for a virtual meeting. So once again, thank you very much. I'm Bob from Dale Carnegie Training. Our information is up on the uh, screen here. If anybody wants to get in touch with us, I'll stay on the line for as long as this meeting is today. Uh, but we have uh, the uh, our website, which is our local website and our phone number, which rings into our offices here. And once again, we work with organizations for leadership training, presentations, sales, customer service, organizational development, whatever your needs might be. So thank you again, Laura and Nancy. We so appreciate you allowing us to come out today and, and work with the, the good members of the Greater Valley. And uh, I'm happy to be a member as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. Nancy, can I say a word? Sure can, Bill. Go right yeah, ahead. Thank you.